Thank you, Mike. That was the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Well, for those of you that aren't pastors, which I'm assuming is everybody here except for me, you might assume that Easter Sunday is the easiest Sunday of the year for a pastor. After all, you don't have to think much about what you're going to preach on, right? You can only preach about one thing on Easter, and that one thing, there's only four versions of it to tell. Of course, the one thing I refer to is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave, and the four versions are Mark's version, John's version, Luke's version, and Matthew's version. Now, this is my fourth year of being your pastor, so I bet you can't guess which version I haven't preached on yet. <laughs> well, it's Matthew's. I, did, I, li- I don't know if I listed Matthew first, but the one that we're reading today, Matthew, is the last version I have to preach on. I guess next year, my fifth year, will be the one I really have to sweat out. <laughs> what am I going to preach on then? I might have to repeat a scripture. Now, the inverse to only having one thing to preach on is you only have one thing to preach on. You have no discretion as to what you can talk about. You know, in the Methodist Church, they don't tell us what to preach on. They give us helpful suggestions in the form of the lectionary. But you can't preach about Jesus turning water into wine or any of the other miracles that he performed. You can't pick an Old Testament prophet to talk about or a New Testament letter, you have to talk about the resurrection. But don't cry for me, because the message that I preach on is easy. It just matters how you package it and frame it. Now, despite the Bible only having four versions of the Easter story, I'm here to tell you something surprising. There are actually millions of versions of the Easter story to choose from. What do I mean by that? Well, everyone here has their own version of the Easter story, their own testimony and eyewitness about their encounter with the risen Christ. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here this morning. Now, each of the four gospel writers chose to emphasize certain details in their accounts And we, when telling our stories, our Easter stories, might choose to emphasize different details of what we find significant in Christ's saving gospel. Our scripture lesson today emphasizes the spectacular. Matthew describes an earthquake happening before an angel of the Lord literally comes down from heaven, moves the stone away himself, and then sits there. That's a pretty action-packed story. And the two Marys witnessed this. So other gospel writers choose to just kind of casually say, the stone was moved aside and the tomb was empty. So if you're thinking about this like a movie, like I tend to do, you might say that Matthew is like the Michael Bay of resurrection accounts. Explosions everywhere. Some of y'all don't seem to get that reference. (laughs) The bottom line being that Matthew emphasized the spectacular nature of this resurrection and an earthquake happening and an angel literally coming down from heaven and moving the stone. Pretty spectacular that the other Gospels do not mention. Now, whatever details are emphasized, the stories all have one thing in common. They feature an empty tomb. Now, atheists like Dan Barker like to point to differences between the resurrection accounts as proof that they aren't true. He said if the resurrection were true, everybody would have the same story. Well, I say it's just the opposite. In a courtroom, if you were a prosecutor, like I used to be, I guess I'm going to be again (coughs) soon, um, if every witness told the same story, that would be cause for alarm for me. That would show me y'all got together beforehand and got your stories straight about what happened. Because when y'all go home and talk about the service, 
you're not going to tell the same story about what I talked about or the details. You know, so it was very sunny. Oh, it wasn't that sunny. It was a little overcast. You know, it's, it was hot outside. No, it was kind of temperate. You know, everybody tells a different version of the same story. Now, by contrast, the details differed a little bit here and there, but they all agreed on the same central point, then that would be credible to me. So, to use an example, if I was in a trial about somebody that robbed a bank, if everybody said, well, you know, it was 5 o'clock when the bank robber came in, eh, it was 4.58, you know, oh, it was he was in a green car, oh, it was kind of a, a bluish car. I could live with a little differences in detail here and there, as long as they all got the same point right, so-and-so, John Doe robbed the bank. I guess I should be using an example about Medicaid fraud now, because my new boss, Stephanie, is here. So, uh, but that, nobody really knows what that means. Maybe not even me yet. So, I'll pass on that for later. Um, so, we have all four gospel accounts here agreeing on the same important point. The tomb was empty. There's not a, a gospel account that says, well, you know, Jesus' body was still in there. And then, you know, later it was gone. They all say the same thing. Even Mark's account, which says that the women ran away in fear because they uh, and didn't tell anyone. You know, that we've talked about that account before, my first Easter Sunday here. But all of them have that same detail in common. The tomb was empty. Now, earlier I referenced that there were millions of Easter stories to be told. What did I mean by that? Let me give you some specifics. This week at my friend Emery's church, I met a, na a man named Joe. Joe said he had been going to Trinity for many years. I think it was 15 years. He said, I've been going here for 15 years, but no one knows who I am. Now, the reason nobody knew who, well, I'll get to that in a minute. They only saw him on Christmas and Easter and they called him or assumed that he might be a creaster. What is a creaster? Y'all know that those are fighting words in the Christian church. That means that you're somebody that only comes to church on Christmas and Easter. Or as I believe it was Mike Smith, possibly Bill Botknight, said in a sermon at Trenum Road, they come to church on Christmas and Easter for fire insurance. <laughs> what does that mean? Fire insurance is a way to keep out of hell. If I go to church on Christmas and Easter, there's no way I'm going to go to hell. Now, Joe wasn't a creaster. He was a faithful member that had been attending Trinity Episcopal regularly for 15 years. Nobody knew who he was, and nobody saw him because he went to the Wednesday morning service, which is apparently a pretty early service they have before work. Joe didn't have a family of his own, so he was a little sensitive about going to church by himself. And he said, nobody or everybody's by themselves Wednesday morning for service because it's before work, so it's not weird to be there by yourself. Sometimes he would go to the early service on Sundays, I guess their 8.30 service. But it was on Christmas and Easter that he went to the main big shebang service at 11 o'clock. Speaking of which, he told me about his family. He said uh, one particular Easter Sunday was very significant for him. His mother was sick and dying in the hospital. And he had been with her day and night, sitting by her bedside. And one morning happened to be Easter Sunday morning, he said, you know what, I'm going to take a break, and I'm going to go to church at Trinity. And he went to church at Trinity, and he heard the pastor preaching about how he had recently lost his mother. But he talked about the new hope of Easter Sunday and how losing somebody temporarily in earth, earthly life doesn't mean losing them forever, that everybody has the promise of new life and resurrection through Jesus Christ. And he left there feeling better about himself. And he returned to the hospital only to discover that his mother had passed away on Easter Sunday morning while he wasn't there. But he didn't feel bad about it. He didn't beat himself up and say, I should have been there for her because he knew what was important that he had just heard for several times, for not the first time, but he had heard it before, but had really had the message of Easter Sunday hammered home for him, and he felt better about his mother's passing. 
So Joe told me his Easter story, and then I shared my Easter story. Some of y'all might remember this because I preached on it before. But it was five years ago yesterday, April 16th, 2017, and I wasn't feeling too good about myself. I had just been rejected by the Methodist Church. I've gone to appear in front of the District Committee on Ordained Ministry, and they rightly said, I didn't think it at the time, but they rightly said, you're not quite ready to receive a church just yet, become a pastor. But at the time, I didn't see that, and I was feeling down on myself, and I said, you know what? If I'm going to be a pastor, i got to go out and do some things differently. i got to start witnessing to people, evangelizing. And one person at the top of my list was my grandmother, Marilyn Bissell. Now, she lived in Aiken, those of you that remember this story. And the last thing I wanted to do on Easter Sunday afternoon was to go visit my grandmother and witness to her. Because as I said in my previous sermon on this subject, I said, when Jesus said witnessing to your hometown was the hardest thing to do, I don't think he meant to his family. He might have. He meant to the people in Nazareth and Galilee. But for myself, witnessing to my own family is the hardest job, hardest witnessing to do. Now, there was something just telling me, calling me, saying, you have to go down there today, Scott. You can't just call this, you know, sit this one out and sit on the couch Sunday afternoon like you usually do. You got to go down there. So I did, and I had my conversation with her. I don't, I certainly wasn't eloquent with doing my witnessing to her. It probably sounded like, uh, 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 bumbling a little bit, you know. And I'm sure it wasn't very smooth like a, a Billy Graham witnessing would be. But five years ago today, April 17th, 2017, my mother called me while I was at work and said, your grandmother passed in the night last night. Now, did my talk have its desired effect? I don't know. But what I do know is that I had a hope that it did. I was so much happier and thankful that I had gone down there and talked to her, and that that voice telling me to do something, little did I know at the time, that time really was of the essence. So I actually have a hope that my Easter message shone through on Easter Sunday, more so certainly than if I hadn't done anything at all. Now, we've all had our encounters with the risen Lord that we can tell others about, or have we? Maybe you've been listening to me this whole time, and you've said, yikes, I might be a priester. I haven't been to church that recently. Maybe I only come on Christmas and Easter. Maybe I am here for fire insurance. And you know what? I don't have an inspiring story to tell like Joe or Scott. What am I supposed to do when it comes to sharing my faith? That's okay. I called this sermon, Why Are You Here? Because I wanted to ask the question, and I wanted you to think about the answer. Ask yourself, what is my own encounter with the risen Lord? And have I shared it with anybody? Now, it doesn't have to be a cool story, if you consider my story cool. Joe's is cooler than mine. And it really doesn't have to be expressed in words. Your actions can and should speak louder than your words. Now, I'll leave you with one final Easter story this morning to consider. And it has to do with the call to worship that Mike read us this morning. Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph was a rich man who became a disciple of Jesus Christ. And perhaps more so than anybody in the history of the world, he really put his money where his mouth was. By asking Pilate to, to give him Jesus' body. I would imagine if somebody had just killed the person I was following, it might not be the easiest thing to do to then go and ask him, can I have his body please? But Joseph had the courage to do that. But more importantly, what he did was that he gave away his tomb. The tomb that he had just either bought or actually the scripture says cut out for himself, which I imagine was an easy work. And he had just given that over for Jesus' body. Now, maybe he could have bought another one. 
And it wasn't that big of a deal. Our scripture does say that he was rich. Or maybe he believed in Jesus more than the disciples did, and he knew his tomb wouldn't be occupied all that long. Or, perhaps more likely, he didn't know exactly what would happen, because certainly the disciples didn't quite get Jesus' uh, message when he said that he would rise again in three days, despite having spent three years with him and seen all of his miracles. But, perhaps Joseph of Arimathea knew that he wouldn't need the tomb himself. Although his earthly body was bound to waste away eventually and turn to dust, he didn't care about that because he had a heavenly kingdom to look forward to. What did he or any of us, or what should he or any of us, <laughs> care about what happens to our earthly body as long as we know what happens to our soul? Now, is there a better image for an Easter story than an empty tomb? Maybe. How about a tomb that's occupied? A tomb that's occupied by Jesus in our own stead, in our own tomb. Because Jesus did take our place in death. He took our place in death so that we didn't need a tomb anymore for ourselves. We don't have to worry about death and where our bodies will end up because Jesus overcame death with his sacrifice for us on the cross. In other words, he took the place of where our sin should lead us to. Our sin should lead us to the grave and to damnation. But Jesus took our place and allowed us all to have empty tombs. Tomorrow I'm presiding over Gary's funeral, or assisting with it, and Gary's body will be placed into the ground. But his tomb is not going to remain full all that long. It will be empty, like all of ours will be, eventually, on the day of resurrection, if we're here this morning for the right reasons. And of course, the right reason, only reason, is to celebrate the risen Lord today, but not only today, but every day, for the rest of our earthly lives that God allows us to be on this earth we celebrate the risen Lord, one day we won't have a need for a tomb. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.